blame, forgiveness, and apology. Professor Matt Miranda Fricker um, from CUNY Graduate Center, City University of New York, based in Sheffield, isn't it? Or well, you're based in Sheffield, is that right? I used to be in Sheffield, I'm in New York. You're now in New York. I, I did try and get that right, yes. Um, <laughs> Professor Glenn Pettigrew from Glasgow University, and Professor Eleanor Mason, who is Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at Edinburgh. Right, I've got that right now. The first to speak will be um, Professor Pettigrove. Um, so we'll have the lights out for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for being in attendance. I'm looking forward to our conversation together. Often when I talk about it for a few minutes, at the end, there will be a handful of people who find themselves approaching the lecture and saying, everything you said presupposes that we know what we're talking about when we're talking about moral stuff, that we know where our moral judgments come from and when they're reliable. And I'm not sure that I know any of those things. So goes the question. So tonight, perhaps foolishly, I'm going to try and think about the question of forgiveness and apology in relationship to a particular approach to theorizing about where ethics comes from. And the approach in question is one that has a nice heritage going back at least to the 17th century in the work of Francis Shaftesbury. Um, it also gets developed more fully by Glasgow's own chair of moral philosophy, Francis Hutchison, and gets popularized by this fellow, David Hume. Hume, notoriously, in his treatise, makes the following suggestion. When we're thinking about moral matters, we shouldn't be chiefly focused on reasoning. Instead, we should be focused on feeling, on emotion, or what he called passion suggesting that morality is more properly felt than judged of. In his characteristically dramatic form, in another place in the treatise, he puts it the following way, suggesting that reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions, and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. This thought was echoed a few years later on the other side of the Atlantic, by Thomas Jefferson. At the same time, Adam Smith is developing his own moral theory rooted in the sentiments. And each of them, like Hume and Hutchison and Shaftesbury before them, thought that we should be looking at our emotions to explain where our moral ideas come from and how we come to make judgments about rights and wrongs, goods and bads, oughts and ought nots. That research program has recently been picked up again by a number of researchers who are drawing on work in neuroscience. In particular, they're drawing on a conception of the human brain that is described in terms of two processes. Dual process theory suggests that we have two ways of engaging with the world and processing the information we receive from the world. One of these is quick and dirty and intuitive and is largely driven by evolutionarily early bits of the brain. Another is slower, more deliberative, and largely driven by evolutionarily later bits of the brain. And the question then is, if you think this is how the mind works, which of these is doing the heavy lifting when we make judgments about moral stuff? And a number of psychologists have attempted to design experiments to test out which of these might be more active at the time that we're making moral judgments. One of these is a guy named Jonathan Haidt, who, in one of his tests, decided to ask people to carry either a light or a heavy cognitive load. The cognitive load in question for the light case was he would just ask people to remember the number seven. For the heavy case, he would ask them to remember a seven-digit number, 725-0475. Characteristically, if you're carrying a heavy cognitive load, 
then if the task that you're set requires the use of a lot of deliberate thought, you will slow down in your processing of whatever the task is that you've been sent. Whereas if you don't have to make use of slow deliberate thoughts, you'll be able to answer fairly quickly. And one of the interesting things to come out of this experiment was that it did not matter whether you were carrying a heavy cognitive load or a light cognitive load, people made moral judgments at the same speed. A second kind of experiment that Pike has designed involves what he calls moral dumbfounding. What he does is he gives his subjects a moral scenario and asks them to make judgment about what's going on in that scenario and whether it's right or wrong. Characteristically, he gives them scenarios that they will judge to be wrong. He asks them for their reasons, they give their reasons, and then he redesigns the scenario in a way that eliminates or addresses those concerns. So, one example is an example of a medical student who is currently assigned to work with a cadaver, and this medical student finds herself wondering what human flesh tastes like. Uh, not because she has any particular desire to become a cannibal, but you know, she's just curious. She's read about cannibalism, it sounds kind of weird, and well, there's a fresh body that's just been wheeled in, and they're not going to miss a body. And, and so she lops off a bit, and she takes it home, and she cooks it really well to make sure that you know any germs or contaminants are taken care of. And she makes sure that nobody's going to find out about this, so that public trust won't be undermined um, in the hospital system or the medical training system, etc. And so he designs it to take away all of the things that you might point to and say, that is wrong, right? And then he presents subjects with the case. And characteristically, the subjects respond in the way that your faces are showing you respond, right? Because most of you are doing something like this. <laughs> what he thinks this suggests is that what's doing the work as people are making a judgment about this case isn't the set of reasons that they characteristically would offer and ask why they think it's wrong. Instead, he thinks what it highlights is they have an emotional reaction. And that emotional reaction is what determines the moral judgment they make. That reaction might be that it's disrespectful, or typically that it's disgusting. Right? He's designed several of these. One involves inviting students to drink a glass of juice that has a roach in it. Lots of these experiments are conducted on um, undergraduates, um, mostly in the United States. And he offers them a couple of dollars in exchange for drinking the roach juice. And then tells them, no, I know you're going to turn your eyes up at the thought of drinking juice that has this roach in it, but this roach has been raised in a lab environment in a hermetically sealed area where you did not have any exposure to germs or disease. Furthermore, after the roach was humanely terminated, um, it was exposed to radiation that would eliminate any fossil germs. And so this is the cleanest thing your lips will ever touch. Right? And still, almost none of his subjects are willing to take the two to five dollars he's offering them in exchange for drinking this glass of juice with the roach in. A third scenario that he's designed is aimed at selling one's soul. And so what he does is he asks a group of students, how many of you think you have soul? And he looks at the hands that are in the air, okay, how many of you think humans don't have souls? And another set of hands go up, and, and then he only conducts the experiment on those who are in the second group who don't think that they have soul. So he then offers them a contract whereby they agree to sell their soul in exchange for $2 or $5 or $10, or even $10, he can't get these students to sign on the top of the line, characteristically, to give away this thing they don't think exists. Right? So his question is, why exactly are these responses so persistent? And the answer he comes to is the following, that people in these experiments made moral judgments quickly and emotionally. 
Moral reasoning was mostly just a post hoc search for reasons to justify the judgments people had already made. In other words, he thinks the reason giving process is fundamentally a role like the role of C.J. Craig in the fictional tales of the West Wing, where her role is that of the press secretary. The objective of reasoning is to sell somebody else on what you have independently decided on other grounds. To make allies and friends, to recruit them to think about and feel about the scenario in the same way that you do. Now, there are a number of ways in which one might push back against Jonathan Hyde's experiments, and one might wonder whether he has, in fact, isolated the variables in the way that he thinks he has. I'm just going to set those to one side, because my project here isn't to convince you that moral judgment is grounded in emotion. My project is just to say, here's one story with some plausible but not yet decisive evidence that has been developed in its support. And you might be able to then think about some of our common responses to wrongdoing by making use of this resource. It can explain some of the attitudes that we have when we find ourselves in contexts where somebody has wronged us. So the next step in thinking about this is just to notice that there's a really strong and obvious connection between some of our moral judgments and emotions. Take the following kinds of judgments. The judgment that something is irritating, right? That's a judgment that is not going to be in its favor. You're not endorsing it when you say that's irritating. And obviously, you're making an appeal to the emotion of irritation. Or to say that's enviable. Again, you're making an appeal to an emotional state. To say that's funny or amusing, again, has built into it a claim about the goodness of the thing and the emotional response that people characteristically have to that kind of thing. And so for lots of the terms of approval or disapproval that we use in everyday life, we have already on the face of the terms we employ an appeal to an emotional condition. The question is, is there a way to get to some other moral terms that we use from an emotional base? Terms that don't wear emotions on their face in the way that the irritable or the horrendous wear their emotions in the term itself. And one proposal is a proposal that we ought to be angry at wrongdoers, that anger is a fitting response to wrongdoing. So you have on the screen a number of champions of this position. Um, we've got Maisha Cherry and Charles Griswold. Uh, Charles is at Boston University. Maisha Cherry is at the University of California at Riverside. Um, Pamela Hirami is at the University of California at Los Angeles. Tara Smith is at the University of Texas. Um, David Shoemaker is at Tulane. And Jeff Murphy at Arizona State University have all argued that the appropriate response, the fitting response to being wronged or to seeing others wronged is some form of anger. And so you might try and tie wrongness to experiences of anger in the same way that you might tie irritating to irritation or enviable to envy. If this is your story, then it looks as though there's a particular problem that is going to arise for anybody who's thinking about forgiving a wrongdoer. Why? Well, the opening step in the argument is that anger is the fitting response to wrongdoing, and the next step is to note that forgiving involves letting go of anger. It may involve more than that. Um, we can talk at greater length in the question time if you want to, and you'll hear additional discussions of what else might be involved in forgiving. But in most of the instances we naturally think of where someone is forgiving someone else, there's been some anger involved in the scenario at some stage, and there's a letting go of that anger that's happening at a later stage. But if 
anger is the fitting response to wrongdoing, and forgiving involves letting go of anger, then forgiving involves letting go of the fitting response to wrongdoing, right? And letting go of the fitting response to something is unfitting. So forgiving is unfitting. That's the worry, right? If you're going to tie anger to wrongness in this way, and your judgment of the wrongness of the thing involves you feeling anger about that thing, then it looks as though forgiving, letting go of that anger, is in some way abandoning the fitting response. But never fear, there's a way to save this, and to continue to map on to some of the intuitions we have about places where people have forgiven and we approve of it. So, one way to do this is to think about apologies. When the wrongdoer has apologized and made amends, anger is no longer fitting. And letting go of an unfitting response is fitting. Forgiving involves letting go of anger, as we just noted. So, when the wrongdoer has apologized and made amends, then forgiveness is fitting. So, we can explain why we might be worried about somebody forgiving? Oh, that looks like an unfair response. And why might why we might approve of someone forgiving when the other party has apologized and made amends for the wrong that they did? I want to problematize this, and I'll do so quickly. One reason I want to problematize this is that the story that we're telling is one built around an assumption that there's one fitting response to the circumstances we find ourselves in. But of course, that's seldom the case. In many, maybe most situations, where an agent has been wronged, she should feel a number of different attitudes. She, if she sees this as an expression of frustration on the part of the other individual who's doing the wrong, and as an act of last resort, she might feel compassion for the circumstance in which they find themselves. Or if it's someone she knows and has admired who in this action has revealed a deep character flaw, the fitting response might be a sadness at the weakness that has been displayed. If she realizes that she just acted in that same way yesterday to somebody else, then what she might feel is chagrin at her own behavior. Or, if the person who's done them wrong is someone whose moral development she's responsible for, she might feel excitement at the teaching moment that has just presented itself. <laughs> and if the wrongdoer is someone she loves but recognizes is flawed, she might just carry on loving them or hoping for their transformation, etc. So there can be a number of different responses. And the thing to note is these responses don't play well together. So a human agent can't feel all of these emotions at the same time. They have different facial expressions. They have different skin conductance. They have different blood pressure associated with them. That's just thinking about two negative responses, sadness and anger. They have different ways of processing information, of making predictions, etc. So. What we get is, even with two closely aligned emotions, we get a kind of conflict between them. If we take some of the other emotions that I just mentioned, well then, the conflicts become more robust. Anger sees its focal object as something negative, whereas hope sees its focal object as something positive. The desires involved are different. That an object suffer is what anger is desiring, whereas to alleviate, to alleviate suffering is what compassion is desiring. And they come with different moral authorities and action tendencies, different physiology and different phenomenology. Okay, so if it's the case that there are many situations in which multiple emotions are fitting and a single human agent can't feel all of these emotions at the same time, and you think ought implies can, Wait, I can't say you ought to do something that is impossible for you to do, is the thought. Then, it's not the case that the virtuous agent ought to feel all of the attitudes that fit a situation. That means that anger is one of the possibilities on the table, 
but that's only one of the possibilities, but then we still have an open question as to how we determine what we ought to feel and how we ought to respond to the situation in front of us. But response, at the very least, even if it's rooted in some sort of emotional profile, can be one where we feel anger and we persist in feeling anger until the other party has done something to make themselves better. At least we can't insist on that without offering an additional argument to say anger is the emotional response that is most fitting in circumstances like this, and it trumps compassion and love and hope and excitement and sadness and the like. Last observation. That last observation just notes there's an interesting relationship between anger and another emotion, namely fear. The circumstances in which people are characteristically most angry are, char are circumstances in which they feel most powerless, and circumstances in which they feel their powerlessness as a vulnerability to continued aggression from another. So, in these contexts, if you can eliminate fear, often quite independently of anything else that's going on in the circumstance, you can eliminate anger. So, any story about fitting attitudes in the aftermath of wrongs will need to pay attention to fear as well as to anger. Why is this interesting? Well, here's one reason it's interesting. No one has tried to argue that a victim's fear ought to persist until the wrongdoer has made amends or has repented of the wrong that they've done. Whereas lots of people have tried to argue that anger ought to persist until the wrongdoer has repented and made amends. Furthermore, no one has argued that the accuracy or the utility of fear pose an objection to anyone who wants to develop courage, which would involve overcoming or setting aside fear, even in the face of objects that are fitting objects of fear, namely dangerous ones. Why is this interesting? Well, there are lots of people who have argued you shouldn't let go of your anger until the other party has <coughs> repented and has made amends. Because anger is a fitting response to wrongdoers, and you can't let go of that fitting response. But notice, in relation to another kind of emotion, namely fear, we're happy to say it's okay to let go of that fitting response. Sometimes, in fact, it's virtuous to let go of that fitting response. Why? Well, because we think it's possible for someone to overcome their fear without thereby becoming blind to the moral matters that stand in front of them, the goods or the bads that pose dangers to them. The upshot, then, of all of this is just the following thought. Even if you want to tell a story where moral judgment is rooted in emotion, the story is going to need to be more complex than just this is a fitting object of that attitude, therefore feel that attitude. Because there are too many other attitudes, and there are too many other cases, like the fear case, where we think it's okay to let go of the fitting attitude. That indeed, maybe it's even virtuous. Why do we think it might be good to let go of it? Well, there are lots of reasons. But many of these reasons have to do with the kind of thing that David King was interested in way back at the beginning, which is that when people do this, when they let go of their anger, even when the other person hasn't made it easy to let go of their anger, we look at them and we think, good on them. Isn't that impressive that they were able to get past this and move on? And so, at least sometimes, when agents are able to let go of that fitting response, what we find ourselves doing is approving that emotion, approval, is what he thinks helps us identify the virtues. And that needs to go in our taxonomy alongside these other fitting emotions in some complex way that I haven't yet spelled out to help us determine when 
we ought or ought not judge and feel certain ways about certain contexts. Thanks. Now, Professor Eleanor May um, will take this idea forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, what philosophers are doing when they talk about things like blame, apology, forgiveness, they're taking an idea that's used commonly and kind of looking at the way it's actually used and then trying to improve on that. So saying, so look, the way you actually use this concept is a bit of a mess. So here's some you know, neat thing up that we're going to do. Here's the kind of target. Here's the way that it would be better to use it. So more consistent, more interesting, more useful, something like that. So, that's what we're doing when we talk about things like blame, apology, forgiveness. We're thinking, what can we say to make this a bit neater, a bit more interesting, a bit more useful? <laughs> so I've done a lot of work thinking about blame and blameworthiness, the way that we could use those concepts better and say more interesting things and fit them together with other bits of morality. But I haven't really thought much about forgiveness. And I haven't done any very serious work on forgiveness. And so um, I was asked to talk about forgiveness today. I thought, well, I should think about forgiveness because I've been thinking about blame and I've been thinking about apology. And these things seem connected, right? So I should think about forgiveness. So I started thinking about forgiveness. And, and then I realized I don't really think forgiveness is a thing, actually. I think. We use this idea, we use the word sometimes, but that when I try to drill down into it and think about what it might be and how we might use it better, the conclusion I actually come to is, no, you should to get rid of that idea. It's not one of the good ones. It's not a useful one. So I'm going to try very briefly to defend that conclusion today. So I'm going to start with just some observations about how we actually use the notion of forgiveness. And these aren't decisive, but I hope they're, they're interesting to think about. So one is, think about the phrase, I forgive you. Has anybody ever said that to you? And how did you feel? So I think somebody using the phrase, I forgive you, comes across as unbearably pompous. Like, what? What? I mean, even if you did something wrong, and you know you did something wrong, somebody saying, I forgive you, it just, I don't know, it's just sort of awful. <coughs> so that's just a little bit of data. What's going on there? Why, why would that be? Second thing, I have young children, and I talk to them a lot about apology. So, you know, you've got to apologize. No, not like that. You know, you've got to properly apologize. You've got to mean it. There's a lot of sort of substance in the idea of apology. And I'm talking about blame, too. So blame is like, they bring to me. I, I can kind of force apology on them. Blame, they bring to me. They're always blaming each other or blaming me or blaming something else. And, so I try and teach them how to blame in a sensible way and when blame is appropriate. And you know, these, these ideas that I'm giving to them are not complex and philosophical, but they're, they're real and they are something. We're latching on to something important. But we never talk about forgiveness. So I don't bring it to them, and they don't bring it to me. Forgiveness just doesn't come into our everyday life. Now, maybe I'm a bad parent, I should be bringing it to them. But somehow it seems to me forgiveness is something that's much more of a grown-up thing. Like, it's basically when people have affairs, that's when we talk about forgiveness. And, you know, my kids, we just don't need to, to get into that. So again, 
that's just an observation, and it's a bit of data, but maybe we could find some kind of use for forgiveness that would make sense for this. So, on to um, philosophical ways of meeting up the idea. There's, this comes from a um, Christian philosopher, Marilyn Ford Evans, and this distinction is, I think, sort of commonly used. Um, there's two different things, first of all, that we might mean by forgiveness. So, the first thing is forgiveness as a performative. So that's the I forgive you. I hereby forgive you. In saying these words, I have changed the situation. You are now forgiven. So that's one thing. And then there's forgiveness from the heart, which is what I was looking about, the letting go. So I'm going to say first a couple of things about the performative idea, the I hereby forgive you. So I'm skeptical that this is something that individuals can do. It seems to me that this is an idea that's a sort of hangover or borrowed from a religious or legal model. So in a religious model, you've got someone who's got authority. So they have some kind of authority to, to forgive you, to make things different, to alter your status in a kind of divine um, order. In the legal model, I think it's very easy to understand. This is a pardon. Here are the things that kind of would have happened, but now you've been pardoned, and I have some kind of legal authority to do that. You've been pardoned. Then you know, your status is now different legally. So we've got this religious absolution model or this legal pardon model, but I don't have that status with respect to other people who are just other individuals. But I think mean, that's why it sounds so complex. But it's, it's like you're pretending to an authority that you don't have. So I think, I'm not going to talk more about that. I think that that's, we should just kind of abandon that. Um, so we should take that seriously. It, it, there is something mistaken about saying, I forgive you. And I think that's also kind of backed up by the fact that saying it's much more common to talk about forgiveness in the past saying I have forgiven. Have you forgiven him? Yes, I have. I have forgiven him. So I think the more promising model for understanding what's going on here is the from the heart model. So this, that's um, what Lord Adams is expression for it. And that is the, uh, what Glenn talked about is letting go. So on this model, what's happened is that you've changed your feelings about the situation. So you're not angry or you're not resentful anymore. OK, so I think when we, when we talk about that, there are, again, various things that we might mean within that model. So one thing that we might mean, and I think this is common when we talk about forgiveness in the past tense, is that I have let go. So in this sort of sense, we could even discover that we've forgiven somebody. We could say, you know, how do you feel about your ex and what he did? Oh, I forgive him. I'm over it. Great. You know, I can call him up and go for lunch. That would be just fine. So I can discover that by myself. But although I think we use it like that, I think when we think about it on reflection, we probably want to say, no, that's not really forgiveness, because that just sort of happened. And it, I mean, it happened to me, it just kind of happened. It, it wasn't voluntary, it wasn't deliberate. And what we're looking for, if you think about the concept of forgiveness, as opposed to just changing the way that you feel, is we're looking for something that you did deliberately, something that you chose to do. So, I have forgiven him, if you use it properly, should be an action of yours. It shouldn't just be something 
that I have to do. And I think just it should be something that you do for a reason. So again, I think that this would be in what Ben was saying, that it shouldn't just be something that you just do, like, oh yeah, I walked across the room and I walked back. I didn't have any reason for doing that. It should be something that you do for reasons. So it should be um, articulate. It should be something that makes sense. Like, yeah, this, this is something I chose to do, and I had a reason to do it. So this raises the question, well, what would the reason be? So one kind of reason that, that I think would be a good reason to, to let go of um, resentment is it's bad for you. Anger eats you up. It's, it's not nice to be angry at people. So I think that's one thing people mean. They say, um, you know, I forgive them. I did it because I was just eaten up and it wasn't good. <coughs> Sorry, puts an obligation on me to 
forgive him. So first of all, commonsensically, it doesn't. I'm still allowed to be angry if I want to be. But second, that seems too transactional. It just seems like a debt model or a legalistic model. Like, you do a bad thing, um, say sorry, and that's it, it's, it's over. And that's not how it works. So forgiveness, in the sense of from the heart forgiveness, can't be sort of commanded or made obligatory in that way. So him, him being sorry or him repenting can in a way be a reason for me to forgive. But it's not clear exactly how it works. Why? Why? Why do I care if you're sorry? So I think maybe a, a kind of way to understand what's going on there is that what happens is that we come to understand maybe why he did it. Um, and although we don't think it's excused, we, him, and him repenting, I think, is part of, can be part of it, it isn't always, but it can be part of <coughs> understanding and sort of feeling <coughs> kinder, um, just taking a gentler attitude to it. <coughs> and I think that's something that, that happens. But now we're sort of back at the beginning. So this, again, is looking like reconciliation. It looks like what's going on here is that we, we just want to get back to friendship, or at least a sort of peaceful state where I'm not eaten up by anger. And now I'm able to do that because I've been able to see him in a better life, and his being sorry has helped me to do that. But, you know, all, it's, all I'm really doing here is describing the very complicated ways that grown-ups feel about each other. And that's why I think forgiveness doesn't really come into moral education earlier. But also, I think it's why there isn't really one thing. What we've got is this cluster of things. We have all these feelings. We have complicated reasons for giving up on them. But I just don't see a clear enough thing that we could latch onto and analyze and say, yeah, that's the thing, that's forgiveness, that's the proper analysis of it. Instead, we've just got this sort of whole bunch of different things, which are all you know, good things to do, but not clear enough to sort of philosophically analyze properly. So uh, that's probably going to be all the work I do on forgiveness, because <laughs> I'm saying, I don't really see a thing there. So, thank you. Okay. <laughs>
design. We might, we might find that in the course of our conversation, your pushback shows me that actually there are a few mitigating circumstances that I haven't quite taken into account. They might just be plain excuses, and in your apology you say, God, I'm so sorry, I don't know what I was thinking, but you know, I'm going through a hideous divorce and my, my judgment's been way well on recently. Or it might be, well, you really do give me a reason which exonerates, and you explain that you had to tell me this lie, because otherwise something disastrous would have happened, and you're really sorry, but you hope I understand why you did it. So this can be a conversation in which you present me with one or another kind of mitigating circumstance, which might lead me to reduce the level of blame quite a bit, perhaps just a little, perhaps a lot, maybe even down to zero. And after I received this some sort of apology for whatever degree of blameworthiness uh, remains, if indeed you are kind enough to apologise, a normal kind of a normal run of things would have that cue mean to forgive you. To so as my colleague said, to let go of the resentments or other sorts of blame feelings that I may have been feeling towards you for this lie that you told me. So that's a little sort of ideal narrative of how these things can go. And of course, it doesn't always go that way. You might not apologise to me. I might totally have a sort of crazy over-response to your lie and fly off the handle and instead of doing a decent communicative job of explaining why I find fault with you, I might just cause a massive rupture in our friendship which somehow ends it. But when we're doing a decent job of responding to each other and responding to wrongdoing, we, I want to suggest, succeed in communicating blame in an appropriate register and with appropriate kinds of resentments or disappointments or forms of sadness. I think these are all appropriate emotions that can accompany the attitude of blaming, finding fault. The wrongdoer will apologise and forgiveness may be forthcoming. That's not the only thing that can prompt forgiveness, but it's a kind of standard story. And one thing to note, I'd like to invite us to think about <coughs> that little narrative of wrongdoing and one's response to it um, in relation to time and in relation to the purpose, the moral purpose that we might think of that pattern of response as serving. In relation to time, partly just because these things are not uh, in an instant snap judgment, they are cognitive and emotional processes which have a duration. And they might, in fact, have an extremely long duration. I might wrong you so dreadfully that it takes you a lifetime to come to forgive me. Sometimes people really look to try and forgive another before they die because they want to leave this world without any sort of residual resentments and main feelings. Sometimes, on the other hand, it just take, does take an instance. It's a trivial case, but it's still a duration in time and it's to be thought of as a process. And I think in particular in connection with forgiveness, it's very useful to think of forgiveness not only as a, a response in the moment, but as a process and an effort. We might partially succeed in forgiving for a while and then realise that our bad, ill feelings of resentment rise up again and we have all lost it and then we try more. And it can be a real job of work that uh, has a long duration and effort put into it. But these responses are also helpfully thought of as situated in time in another way, which is that if somebody wrongs you pretty badly, say, tells you a terrible lie, an important lie about something, you can't believe they lied to you about this, um, you're holding them responsible by communicating blame to them is a way of looking to a future version of them, the future version of them which is sorry, does acknowledge that they shouldn't have done, done this thing. So although you're right now confronted with a person who seems to think it was okay to lie to you about such a thing, you're holding them responsible so that you're as well propelling the imagined them into the future self that they will be when they acknowledge they should have known better, they're sorry that they did this thing. And it's the same, so it's a hopeful attitude. Blame, when it's done in that way, is a hopeful attitude. And forgiveness too. I think when you forgive someone who has wronged you, and perhaps it's especially obvious if you forgive them without them having apologised to you yet, you are taking a hopeful attitude towards them so that you look to them to become a version of themselves that is sorry for this, that does acknowledge that what they did was wrong and that they shouldn't do it again. So this kind of hopeful attitude that I think can be implicit not only in forgiveness but also in blame uh, is a kind of future-oriented 
which I think is, is worth noticing. Now, as to purpose, I like a view of these uh, responses which makes explicit what the useful, morally useful form of these practices is. <coughs> Learning can take many forms. It can be uh, uh, uncommunicated, it can be excessive, it can be terribly angry, it can be disproportionate, it can be cold and resentful. There's lots of modes of blaming, which I think we're probably better off without. Um, the kinds of blame, too, which involve kind of retributive attitude, where you wrong me, and I basically want to punish you. I want you to suffer because you did this wrong thing. <coughs> I personally don't believe in that. Lots of people do. They believe in retribution as a moral response. I personally don't know what that's meant to be. It seems to me like it's really a kind of botched version of what I call communicative blame, which is a form of blaming where after you're wrong, you communicate with the wrong that you find fault with them for what they've done, and what your aim is in letting them know that you find fault with them is to bring them to see what was wrong with their behaviour. And this, as ever, will, of course, not be the end of the conversation. You might have got things a little bit out of proportion, and they have a turn to push back and say, well, actually, I'm making a little bit too much of a big deal or present the excuses, as I said at the beginning. But the aim, I think, of the best... And in fact, honestly, I think the only useful kind of blame, the only morally progressive kind of blame, is to bring the other to be on the same page as you about what the moral significance of what they've done is. And of course, they might change your attitudes to you, but the idea is they'll eventually come to a shared, or at least more nearly aligned forms of moral understanding of what they've done and in what respects it hurt you. So I think that's a very useful form of blame. So we might think about its purpose being also situated in time to make a kind of moral cognitive change in the wrongdoers so they come to see things differently, see the error of their ways, as we sometimes say. Apology is a very interesting uh, kind of response that one has to being blamed, because apology is what one does when one steps up and acknowledges, yes, I shouldn't have done this. You apologise. You put yourself exactly on the same page as the person who blamed you by saying, yes, hands up. You're right. I'm, I don't know what I was thinking. I should never have lied to you about this thing. It's absolutely ridiculous. I'm, I'm so sorry. That is to perform and to express the fact that, yes, you now are morally aligned in terms of your moral understanding of what you've done. You are on the same page. And that is why apology then prompts the of the, as it were, for swearing, the attempt to let go of your base feelings towards the person, because they, they serve their purpose. You've already got them to see the error of their ways, and now they've shown you they see the error of their ways, you can and should try and let it go. Now, what's so useful about talking about for swearing one's main feelings or resentments towards the wrongdoer is that, as we all know, it's not always so easy to just let those bad feelings go. We might think, right, now I really should. You know, she said she's sorry, I care about our friendship, I really need to let these feelings go. That's appropriate now. We might not manage to. As we all know, that can be very hard if it was a very seriously nasty thing that was done to you. And so, for swearing is to commit to trying to make those main things subside, to render them irrelevant to how you act with your friend as part of an effort to get the relationship back on track. So for swearing is really the crucial moment of forgiveness. It might take, as I said before, a lifetime to really succeed in getting those feelings to actually go away altogether. Perhaps you can't count as for swearing if you haven't managed to make them go away at all. Uh, Charles Griswold, who Glenn mentions, has a nice account of what for swearing is, more or less in those terms. He says, well, you know, you have to have a little bit of success, like any commitment. You don't really count as committed until you, you, you've shown a little bit of success of uh, living up to the commitment. So same with for swearing, which is basically, for well, swearing you're going to be you're committing to get rid of them, so you don't quite count as doing that just in the, in the moment of expressing the words or having the thought, you've got to have a little bit of success. But full success may take much longer. So, blame, apology, and forgiveness are situated in time, partly because they're processes, and partly because they're processes which have a certain sort of aim, or in my view, should have a certain sort of aim, and fulfilling that aim takes time. There are perhaps two uh, 
broad kinds of forgiveness. I'd like to focus in particular on forgiveness now. Unconditional, sorry, let's start with conditional forgiveness, or what I think is fairly ordinary forgiveness. Forgiveness of the kind that I've really just described, that has two sides to it. There's a kind of exchange that's gone on. You've wronged me, and I've named you, and then you've apologised, and because you've apologised and shown me that you share the moral understanding of what you've done that I have, it's now time for me to forgive. That's called conditional forgiveness. If I only forgive you on condition that you apologise. And sometimes we might say to another, I'm not ready to forgive you yet. How can you say you're sorry? So I'm standing there, it starts, I think of it as a stance of moral demand. Like, I'm not going to give you this release until you show me you acknowledge what you did and that you understand. In this way, I do think the blaming and forgiving process is how we educate each other all the time. It's not just, um, I feel we rely on each other to keep tapping each other on the shoulder and say, hey, that's not okay and this is why. And in situations where our forms of moral understanding are socially changing quite rapidly, we in particular rely on it to learn new forms of wrongdoing, new things it's best to avoid, or new things that it's now okay to do, so that we, as it were, stay on track with each other in terms of what feels like a wrong to be on the receiving end of. So, conditional forgiveness is a stance of demand, and it demands that shared moral understanding ahead of time before the forgiveness is forthcoming. By contrast, and very markedly, there's a whole other tradition of forgiveness, and that is unconditional forgiveness, where you wrong me, and maybe you're not at all sorry. You don't apologize, you're not at all remorseful. Maybe I know full well that you really, you, you just don't care about me, honestly. But I decide, for whatever reason, to forgive you anyway. I decide to bypass my entitlement to stand there and make a demand that you apologize, and I just think, you know what? I just want to forgive up front, unconditionally. And we have a long sort of tradition of thinking about this as an especially magnanimous thing to do. And I think the reason it's especially magnanimous is precisely because we are um, letting go of that entitlement to, to demand the apology. And uh, kind of a, a literary example, which I'm sure I will uh, you know, mangle terribly, but in Victor Hugo's extremely long book, Many Is Enough, there is an example of a character, John Valjean. I can't honestly truthfully say that I've read the whole book, but anyway, here's the story, and I, I think it's uh, not too magical, and it will serve our purpose. Famous example, much used example of unconditional forgiveness, where Jean Valjean is, starts off as quite a good guy near the beginning of the novel, ends up around the middle doing some terrible things, including lots of thieving and so on, and the priest takes pity on him and takes him in for the night. But unfortunately, Valjean, true to recent form, gets up early and makes off in the morning with the rectory silver. But later, brought back by the scruff of the neck by a couple of gendarmes who represent him to the priest, and the priest does an extraordinary thing. The priest, number one, says the lie, so the lie says, no, it's okay, I gave him permission to, to take the silver. And indeed, I think he continues to insist that Valjean keeps it. But he also, so it goes, forgives Valjean, even though Valjean is utterly unremorseful at this point in the novel. And the story continues on, but much later, Valjean, as it were, is in some sense reformed, restored to his former self, and that the unconditional forgiveness he was awarded is at least part of that story about why he comes to his senses and uh, returns, as it were, a more, to a more honest version of himself, having been stunned by the generosity of this gift of unconditional forgiveness that he received from the priest. As I say, apologies to specialists in Victor Hugo, but this, in fact, cartoon version will do very nicely for what we want. And what we see there, Remember I talked about what I think the best purpose of blaming and forgiving is in terms of finding ways to align the moral understanding and renegotiate moral understandings on the part of the wronged and wrongdoer. We see there that whereas <coughs> conditional forgiveness demands a shared understanding up front in the form of apology or some other expression of remorse, the unconditional forgiver, one way of making sense of the purpose of that practice, I would never say it's the only purpose, but one way of seeing it as belonging to the family of responses 
through which we hold others responsible and through which we, in the board, aim to establish shared moral understandings, is that in fact, when you unconditionally forgive, the fact that the wrongdoer is moved by the <coughs> unprecedented generosity of your forgiving up front makes it quite likely that he or she will come to their senses, come to a, there is a disarmed and they're more likely to come to a position of moral honesty about what they've done than if you just keep bashing them with blame. And if we see it like that, when unconditional forgiveness can work like that, then we see it serving the same purpose as conditional forgiveness and indeed as of communicative blame, namely to prompt and inspire over time a shared moral understanding of the wrong done, shared by the wrongdoer and the wrong party. And so I present that to you as a little picture of at least what I think of as a kind of ideal practice of blaming and forgiving, which gives us an answer to a question that I'm often prone to ask, which is, I mean, what's, what's the point of these practices? How should we respond to wrongdoing? How should, if we step back from our conventional moral practice and we think, which ones are the good, morally useful ones, and which ones are just the lousy ones that create, make things worse and create more resentment? I want to say, well, I like the ones that encourage shared moral understandings, so that our natural tendency towards selfishness, forgetfulness of other points of view, or our natural finite inability to know how it is for everybody in the room to, to have already factored in other sorts of perspectives on what we do. That's all corrected for by the fact that they will tell us. They will communicate to us when we get it wrong. They tell us that this wrongs them and this hurts them. And we, as it were, align our understandings with theirs. That, to me, is a very hopeful picture. And what, we, what our reactions to moral wrongdoing really ought to be doing, which is generating shared forms of moral understanding. And in fact, to be honest, I tend to think that once we see these on the ground interpersonal attitudes and responses to wrongdoing in this way, we might come to think of these as the most fundamental engines of what it is to have a shared moral life at all. But, last little set of points, I'm particularly interested not only in what the useful moral purpose of our responses to wrongdoing might be, so that we can help select the ones that are maybe put out of service, the ones that are doing no good, like the contributive ones or the excessive ones. I'm also interested in how these practices might be intrinsically prone to deteriorate and to fall into dysfunctionality of various kinds. Of course, any human practices can go wrong. But some of our practices are very interesting because there some intrinsic features of them make them especially susceptible to lapsing into bad faith forms of themselves or deteriorated forms of themselves, like forgiveness deteriorating into a kind of passive-aggressive form or the expression of a kind of martyr complex or whatever it might be. So let me just end by three points in connection with forgiveness that I think help us understand why many of us feel a bit ambivalent about forgiveness. And on one hand, we can see it as a morally useful and generous and admirable thing to do, and indeed an essential thing to do if we're able to put wrongs into the past and so on. But on the other hand, worry that quite often forgiving uh, I mean, Ellie expressed some of this, forgiving is a little weird thing to do sometimes. It seems like a kind of form of moral condescension or sometimes reminding the person of a wrong they've done. Well, it feels a bit mistrustful about people who are in the business of forgiving. It's a bit morally grand. Why do we think that? I think, I think uh, there's three points I'd like to make which I think help explain why you might feel this kind of ambivalence. One concerns the verbal forms of forgiving in particular. So, only said, I forgive you, sounds like something that doesn't get said very often and could be said in, in a very annoying, grandiose, morally condescending way. Well, I agree, I think there can be apt versions of it, but even in the apt versions of it, it's a bit risky. Now, this is because of the power, in quite general, the power of presupposition to any sort of conversational move. So, um, the sorts of examples in philosophy of language which are brought to remind us of the power of presupposition are things like, supposing I've got a bunch of teenagers at home who are, you know, I've gone out so they can cook dinner with their friends and have a bit of an evening, and I'll, I'll be coming back and thinking, I wonder what they're 
the state and the find the place in our state. My friend said, even Grace might have done washing up. What do you mean, even, even Grace? If you mean she like never normally does anything, if you're implying she's just really a lazy person and she never even washes up, I think that's really unfair. So I introduced into the conversation, without saying Grace is really lazy and she never shows up after herself, I introduced that term here subtly by the way of presupposition by saying even Grace might have done a bit of washing up. It can be challenged, they can say, what do you mean, even Grace? But very often these things kind of sneak under the radar of challenge because it's a bit, of a, a bit of a rude thing to do to say, what do you mean? And normally the conversation just kind of carries on. That presupposition somehow stays in circulation and is accommodated, which is the philosopher's word we often use, the process of accommodation. So we accommodate this rather than something idea that raises a lazy person and never washes up after herself, uh, unless somebody really sticks their neck out and challenges it explicitly. And a philosopher called Ray Langton has taken this on uh, in connection with the introduction of prejudicial and stereotypical ideas into a conversation as a way of explaining how they can be insidious in their influence unless someone really sticks their neck out and challenges them. And uh, she calls it backdoor testimony. It's as if I said, Grace is really lazy. But I didn't have to really say that loud and assert it. I snuck it in through the back door by way of presupposition in a way that makes it difficult to challenge. Well, a presupposition of I forgive you is you did a blameworthy thing. Something bad enough that really has me, I legally make this pronouncement. Now, even if I'm not pronouncing and I say much more informally and more friendly spirit say, oh, don't worry, I totally forgive you, it's fine. You're still thinking, yeah, okay, that's the fifth time you've said that to me today. I wish you'd stop mentioning the fact that you forgive me. This is obviously really just a way of keeping on mentioning that bad thing I did to you two days ago. And maybe that is what I'm doing. Maybe I'm, without realising it, kind of surreptitiously blaming still, under cover of forgiving. Backdoor blame. Looks like forgiving, but really we all know what's going on if I'm still blaming them for that thing they did. And I think we all can imagine, or maybe you know from experience, what it's like to be on the receiving end of that sort of really, um, I was going to say disingenuous forgiveness, but I think it actually isn't. I think one can often be really attempting to forgive, trying to kind of, you know, busy for swearing and you know, doing it really, but somehow you're not, you're only halfway in the process and the person knows it full well. What's really happening is you're just kind of going into backdoor blame, even though you perhaps don't realise it yourself. So that is one way in which forgiveness in general, when it's spoken, can be prone, intrinsically prone, to deteriorate into backdoor blame. It's like the return of blame. We're trying to get away from blame, but it draws us back in. There's another way in which I think all kinds of forgiveness, even if they're unspoken, uh, has a kind of instability built into it. And that is, so long as the forgiving is a little bit hard. I mean, sometimes forgiving is just super easy. So you borrow my book without asking, and I go, hey, where's my book? You say, oh, sorry, I took it here. It is. It's like, oh, no worries, it's fine. All over, easy. Barely even worth calling forgiving. But so often, of course, as with serious lies from a person you really care about, and you're devastated that they lied to you about something like this, the thing is really hard. So imagine they have apologised, they're devastated that they did it, and it's caused a terrible rupture in your friendship, and you really are trying to forgive them, you want to move on, you know they're sorry, and you're trying. You might do all sorts of very sensible therapeutic things like talking it through and keeping on talking it through, but sometimes that doesn't really work. And sometimes you need to also supplement anyway with just a good old bit of trying not to go there emotion. You kind of ignore the residual resentments you're feeling towards them. So you could try and put things back on a normal footing. Just get past it by sort of suppressing these feelings that don't seem to be going away through talking. So I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to go on as normal, do our normal friendly things, have lunch, uh, you know, wash up together, get on with life, and hope the feelings subside by not attending to them. Because I know if I keep attending to them, it doesn't seem to be helping. Now that can be a perfectly sensible strategy of forgiveness. It does sound a bit kind of screwed up and British, and I'm just going to deny. But I think actually 
It needn't be played in denial. It can be a matter of attending to the positive and trying to let the negative feelings subside. But the trouble is, of course, you can see exactly why it very easily slips into a deteriorated form, slips into being mere denial, a kind of bad fate, a kind of self-deception. I think I've forgiven you because I'm just not going there. I'm deliberately not attending to those feelings. I'm getting on with life as normal. And yet and yet, somehow these old resentments are sneaking through. And I might be the last to know, but I'm busy doing the right thing, not attending to those residual blame feelings as a, as a mechanism of trying to move on. And yet, it's a mechanism of trying to move on which is intrinsically prone to deteriorate into something more like denial and involved self-deception. Last point. And the last way in which I think a certain uh, tendency to deteriorate is built in, not now to all kinds of forgiveness, but just to the unconditional kind, the kind where there hasn't been any apology or expression of remorse from the person who hurt you, but you, for whatever reason, have tried to find it in your heart to forgive them anyway, to forgive them up front. Now, that is a wonderful thing to be able to do, and I think there are many good reasons uh, to do it if we can, and some people can. But uh, one of the ways in which it, one of the kind of distinctive features of it is that it's very one-sided. Some people call this kind of forgiveness, not unconditional forgiveness, but one-sided forgiveness, because there's no exchange. It's like, you're doing it all on your own. So supposing once again, I'm this person, and my best friend has lied to me about something really important. And I just can't believe that she did this to me, but I'll, you know, talked about it. She doesn't seem to be sorry. She seems to think that she's got reasonable excuses for having done so. I don't buy it. I don't agree with her that these are reasonable excuses. I think they're not good reasons to lie about that to me, and I'm not having it. And we are kind of at loggerheads, and she's just not really sorry. And I might think, we can't come like this. I love this friend. I want our relationship to recover. There's just only one thing for her. I'm going to have to just, you know, one's going to one side of forgiveness. And she might keep, and I say, look, I forgive you for betraying our friendship. And she's like, well, the whole point is I didn't think I was betraying our friendship. And I'm like, no, no, I don't think, no, I think we're at the end of this conversation. I'm going to forgive you. Don't say another word. I'm there. I'm doing it on my own. Don't worry. This doesn't have to be that two-way thing. I'm going to forgive you all on my own because I care so much about our friendship. Now, what's happened then, it seems to me, is that my desire to salvage the friendship combined with my recalcitrance and my, as it were, in, my unwillingness to accept her side of the story is that I am silencing her and I'm engaged in a kind of, um, kind of moral dogmatism perhaps, but certainly a kind of willful one-sided uh, effort of forgiveness, which is not going to be satisfying because she is going to feel totally unheard when I'm saying, no, I'm just doing this all on my own. This is not a healthy version of unconditional forgiveness. And we can see how the effort to do it on one's own can <coughs> deteriorate into that sort of moral solipsism and silencing of the other. So I hope all of this adds up to is a picture of responding to wrongdoing in terms of blame, perhaps all coming apologies <coughs> and forgiveness one way or the other which presents us with a good rationale for why we do it and why the forms in which we do it should take the forms I've described, or so I suggest, but also why we should, why we should treasure the possibilities of forgiveness because of how they succeed in restoring relationships and allowing wrongs to recede into the past. We should be very aware of the fragility of the processes of forgiveness and very aware of our own uh, sort of finitude when it comes to our attempts at forgiving, especially when we're forgiving unconditionally, because it's built into the practice of forgiving, built into human nature, and indeed the situation of being morally wounded, that blame's return is always just off stage. Thank you very much. Am I on any of these? Anyway, 
Anybody who has to leave early, would they like to leave now? Which gives people time to process all these different ideas and thoughts and <coughs> think of their questions. If you'd like to put up your hands, if you'd like to ask a question, wait until the microphone reaches you. Okay, you're all right. Okay. It's going to turn on the end there, in a, in a, in a diamond sweater. And remember to hold it like this, like a pop singer, okay? And you might like to ask who, who you're asking the question of, or it might be to the whole panel. I'm not sure who I'm asking the question to, because I have got, I'm concerned, because I came along to hear about blame, forgiveness, and apology. And I'm not sure who I'm blaming, who I should be forgiving, or who should be giving me an apology, because I thought you were going to mention companies, and governments yeah. and blame one of the items. Whereas I've been married now for 54 years and I've been through all this. <laughs> <laughs> the question I would ask is if you want the example of who should be blamed, who is in fact should get, give for this forgiveness. Again, I visited Auschwitz a year and a half ago. Okay, well, a question The Chancellor of Germany visited it for the first time after 60 odd years of life last week. Should we forgive her? Well, hold on. This is about scaling up, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> so, the answer to the question is very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> One feature which will complicate it has to do with. Who has the right sort of standing to take offense at what the chancellor has or has not done in a circumstance like this? Um, uh, second feature then is, in light of who has the standing to take offense, who has a reasonable standing to forgive the chancellor in a circumstance like this? I don't think I'm going to have the right sort of standing for us to make sense of why I might fly off the handle at the chance of not having been this business. Um, and furthermore, she's not really going to care whether I forgive her or don't forgive her. Um, and so there may be a question as to why I would even be rolling out the idea of forgiveness in the first place in a situation like that. But I think there's a, another complicating feature, which is that the the kind of wrong in question um, is a decidedly political wrong, a moral wrong, against the backdrop of a great moral horror in a previous generation. And there's a question as to the kinds of obligations one has as a leader of a country to recognize remember and speak to the many wrongs that one's predecessors committed in the name of the country that one now lived. This is, of course, still a living issue for Germans. And so this seems like the kind of wrong that she ought to have already been addressing. But of course, there are lots of other ways in which she has been speaking to or addressing it's not as well as she should. Um, but I think all of those mean that this is a really difficult kind of case for us to speak out about 
who's doing the forgiving, when the forgiving is being done, what exactly it is for which we think she stands in need of blame and or forgiveness. Okay, thank you. There's a question here. Professor Mason, you were talking about um, oneself and the other in the situations that you were, um, no, I've got the wrong name. Yeah. <laughs> and we can blame ourselves and we can forgive, forgive ourselves, but can we apologize to ourselves? Would you, any of the speakers, like to say anything about the self and those uh, activities that we've been looking at? Today? Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay. I thought it was too... Yes, you've got the wrong name. Okay, <laughs> sorry, okay. Um, like, I did. Thank you. Yes, I said, you're, you're right. I, mean, I, I think I just wanted to express agreement. So we can blame ourselves, and indeed, one's capacity to blame oneself. If I didn't have that capacity, I wouldn't be a responsible agent at all. Being able to recognise that I've done wrong, in both morally or indeed in, in other ways, like I perform badly in some way, and I might be a lousy member of the team, and my teammates might blame me for having been so careless, or I might be uh, blameworthy morally. This is really fundamentally uh, part of being a responsible agent. Being able to forgive oneself is something that some people think doesn't make much sense. Um, I think it makes eminent sense if we're thinking of forgiveness in terms of conditional forgiveness, because I can recognize that I'm the wrongdoer, I blame myself, and that I'm truly sorry for what I have done. And in the end, maybe even if the person who I wronged doesn't forgive me, I personally think it's, it can be a, it can be a moment when it's permissible for me to forgive, forgive myself, even if she doesn't. It may be that after all, she's being extraordinarily unforgiving and actually <coughs> cruel and unforgiving. So, <coughs> but uh, yes, self-apology, I can't make any sense of. But I think we can see why we wouldn't expect self-apology to make sense if we remember that the purpose of which we agree with the little picture I drew, that the purpose of apology is to demonstrate to the person that you've wronged, that you now see it as they do, or you recognize the full moral significance of what you've done. That's something that since it's me, I already know. I don't need to perform it to myself or express it to myself. So it's already there, the remorse is there. So I think that helps uh, explain why self-apology is the, the old one out of the three. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'd be interested in comments from each of the panelists, but I think I'd first like to hear the response from the second speaker, that's Eleanor, is that right? Um, I'd like to recommend to you, or if you thought about it, tell me your reactions, um, the slightly archaic English phrase to forgive your debts, because I think that is very revealing. Um, so, Today, we're not allowed to lock up people indefinitely for debts. Um, there's a whole process, partly by the state and partly not, for forgiving that. Uh, and that this has been in place for, what, a couple of hundred years, but still seems outrageous to a naive young boy. <laughs> and why is that? It's because on the whole, it seems to be better for everyone for that to be forgiven. And it is a formal process. It is a speech and legal act. So. First of all, I think that's important. Secondly, I think it's, in some sense, an indicator of link between the merely personal and the larger scale. But I also think it makes me disagree with the third speaker, rather, because I think, um, okay, you only have to be slightly cynical to think that the defining uh, aspect of the human species is we bear grudges. And none of you seem to want to say that. I think that's extraordinary. It's unusual in animals. Why do we do that? And it's because we do keep records of other people and we hang on to them. Um, and so I think it's that process that's built into <coughs> us, which you see quite young children talking about justice. <coughs> and so I, have I think a question. That the sense I have for a sense of forgiveness is that it's a personal decision about I'm no longer going to bear that grudge. <laughs> And even if I'm a bit conflicted about that, that's a real speech act and a commitment about what I'm going to try and hold. So that's how I see these things as fitting together. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> um, on, the, on the language thing, I, I forgive the debt, I think that's a 
common thing that you see the origin of an idea that is kept in language, even if we're not using it clearly that way anymore. So I think um, <coughs> that's exactly right. And that's why I call the performative version of forgiveness. It's the pardoning. I think primarily in kind of personal senses, that's not what we need anymore. We need the letting go. And as you put it nicely, you decide not to bear a grudge. And I mean, what I was saying about being skeptical about that wasn't that it doesn't happen. It's just that there's a cluster of things and a cluster of reasons for deciding not to bear a grudge. And that you can't kind of pin it down to something neat enough. But I do think, of course, you can decide not to bear a grudge. And there's a question over here. Yeah, um, thank, you, thank you all so much. Uh, I, mean, I was thinking of two kind of extreme examples. Uh, John Paul II forgiving his would-be assassin, Mehmet Ali, I can't say his surname, Acha. And then the other one, the, a bit, the recent book, The Patient Assassin, who waited decades before he killed the Englishman who ordered the, the massacre at Amritsar. Um, so you, you know, so he, he didn't forget after 25 years and went and assassinated the perpetrator of, of that awful act. And I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not a Christian, but I wonder what you would say about, you know, whenever I hear on the news that someone is forgiving someone who's, who's perpetrated a terrible act <coughs> very quickly, um, I, 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 I think there's a fair bet that that person has deep Christian faith. And what, you know, so why in the Christian religion is there that tendency to unconditional forgiveness? Um, the, the concept of original sin perhaps comes into it. And, you know, is there a moral philosophy equivalent? Do, do we learn morality as social beings? Or is there some innate thing? So C.S. Lewis says we're all born, uh, you know, why, why do we have a conscience at all? And take that as evidence for God. No, I'm not. I'm not uh, okay, is that the question? Yeah. Would you like to address that? <laughs> <laughs> Steve over here. 
Tonight we oh. have to talk a lot about feelings and emotions. And the last speaker seemed to be quite pragmatic in her attitude, you know, but it works then fair enough. I'd like to ask you, can you have a moral logic which applies to these things? And if so, are there moral axioms in which we can base them? I say that someone interested in epistemology. <laughs> I'm not sure what you have in mind by a moral logic, but one, one thing you might have in mind is a, um, a moral theory which has <coughs> operates with strict principles, like a deontological theory, a theory which tells us what our duties are, so we can work out whether we have a duty to do this in certain circumstances from a set of principles. So Kant had a moral theory like that, and ultimately there was just one moral principle which... Uh, could be interpreted in various ways, but here's an inter a common interpretation that um, you only act on reasons that anyone could accept. And so anytime you want to do something, you pause, you check whether it's morally permissible by thinking, is this a reason that anyone could accept? Does it make sense from every point of view? And if it doesn't, then you must refrain and you thereby uh, discover that you have a duty to refrain and you either do or you don't. And if you're a moral person, you you refrain and if you're not a moral person, you go ahead. So that's an example of something, a kind of moral theory that's as close to the idea of moral axioms as I can imagine. Um, I love Kant's moral theory, but I think it's completely wrong because I think it um, abstracts from one feature of uh, one bit of moral life, which is the experience of being absolutely bound by an obligation. And Kant begins all his work by thinking, look, if there's anything that's going to count as morality, it's going to be a set of principles that absolutely binds us. So there's nothing about us that could <coughs> get us off the hook. And he thinks, what sort of thing could that be? Well, it's going to be something that binds us just in virtue of our being rational agents at all. And so he builds the whole theory on the idea of managing to act in a way that... Uh, does not involve a contradiction with our practical reason. So if I act on a reason that someone couldn't accept, then I'm acting on a reason that I can't will for the universality, in which case I'm acting on a reason that I both don't will, and yet I do will when I act on it, and that's a contradiction in my practical reasoning. So, um, but I don't think that there's an awful lot of moral life that isn't like that at all. And I don't really believe in the idea that we can get all of our moral uh, uh, do's and don'ts from the, this attempt to avoid contradiction. So I think there's so many questions where it's not at all clear whether I am acting on a reason that anyone could set, uh, accept. It's just there isn't a determinate answer to that question in so many circumstances. So I'm a skeptic for these reasons about the possibility of uh, any set of moral accidents. I think it comes from the heart and from the custom. And the best kind of custom is one where we talk, I think, in the, in the way that we communicate and exchange reasons to try and establish the moral state of the thing that was just done. And we come to an aligned form of understanding, you know, that becomes one of our shared reasons then, that we, as it were, by way of agreement and understanding how we can and can't hurt each other, we come to a moment of envy and shared moral way of life. But I don't think there's only one possible shared moral way of life. Uh, if somebody does have the microphone, is it a very short very, question? Very quickly. Um, I would agree with the gentleman sitting in front of me uh, that this evening session, uh, I was married for 51 years and I lost my wife last year, and yet from the two lady panelists I felt as if I'd gone through a marriage guidance counselling session tonight. Um, to bring it to a more than mundane question, uh, these days with the political traumas that we're going through in television, it seems to become uh, a way that interviewers in, uh, are forced to ask for an apology from one of our political leaders. Uh, I just wonder what the panel think of uh, the apologies that are forthcoming from the politicians uh, that we see over the last month. So what do they think? They mean it? Or, or is there something uh, not right about it? Yeah, thank you. I think public apology is a really interesting thing. And 
they often get it wrong, and that we really get to catalogue the ways they get it wrong. So the number one way is to offer an excuse at the exact same time they apologize. So I'm sorry, but it wasn't really my fault. And that's a complete fake apology. And the other way is I'm sorry, but it wasn't really wrong. They can offer a justification at the same time. And that's a really fake apology. And then the other fake apology is just this really vague one where they won't clearly admit to having done anything wrong at all, but they won't actually say anything about it, and they're just backing it away. And I think this is actually a good illustration of how what we're doing goes beyond marriage guidance. So we're trying to get these concepts a bit clearer and say, you know, here's what apology is, and here's what it has to be. And now we can see very clearly why these public apologies are nonsense, and, and here's the diagnosis of it. And so I think you know, we start by trying to get these concepts clear and precise and talking about what seems like you know, mundane or just personal cases. But actually, I think there are, there are useful applications that go into the public realm beyond that. We didn't really get there today, but I think that, that we can do. So, yeah, thank you for the question. Right. Well, I think that's a good place to end. So thank you very much for our speaking. Mona Simeon, who arranged this and coordinated this event. And thank, you all. thank you all for coming. This is the last meeting of 2019. The next meeting is on Wednesday, the 8th of January, 2020. Professor Wendy Barclay from Imperial College London will talk about on the next influenza epidemic. So let's hope it doesn't come before then. And um, our very best wishes for the holiday and new year and there are refreshments as usual in the um, other rooms and even more unusually we have mince pies because it's Christmas and it's a special occasion because we have a panel of people from the conference that's just finished in Glasgow. Thank you very much indeed.